every week when we get together, at some point in our service, somewhere after the sermon, we have the pastoral prayer. The prayers of the people are gathered, we pray together, and then we cap it off with the Lord's Prayer every week. When we get together for our ministry council meetings, we generally open with a prayer of some sort, but our closing prayer is always the Lord's Prayer. At the hospital, when I visit with our patients, I, I, I pray with them more often than not. And a lot of the time those prayers move into the Lord's Prayer. It's a prayer that we've learned since we were Sunday school kids. At least I trust that that's true. Now when I was a Sunday school kid, the church that I was growing up in did not pray the Lord's Prayer. Those Baptists, they had a, a certain visceral reaction against any prayer that was a set prayer. The only prayers that counted, so it was said, were the ones that you made up right on the spot. Which means that in the United Church of Christ, where we have a prayer of confession and we have a prayer of invocation and it's all printed in the bulletin, there are those folks out there from my home tradition who would say, that ain't real praying. But the reality is that any time our hearts reach towards God, whether it's our own words, or words that someone else has written, or even a prayer that just goes, ah, that's real prayer. Because prayer is our connection. Prayer is what draws us together with God's Spirit. This week in our reading from Luke, we hear one version of the Lord's Prayer as presented in the Gospels. This past week, I was reading John Dominic Crossan's book, The Greatest Prayer, Rediscovering the Revolutionary Message of the Lord's Prayer. And it's not a big book, but he breaks it down line by line by line, reflecting back and forth on what was going on in Jesus' social and religious world and on this prayer that Jesus crafted that comes straight out of the heart of Judaism, that is a gift, as Crossan says, to the whole world through the person of Jesus. For Crossan, this prayer of Jesus is a revolutionary manifesto, but also a hymn of hope that not only announces the biblical God's call to justice, but that also commits us to the work of God. For Crossan, just like the prophets before Jesus, prayer and justice are presented as two inseparable sides of the same coin. So let's take a look at this prayer that we know so well. Father, our Father. This is one of those great words that, that, that carries two radically different feelings that go with it. So often, we, we, we think of God as Father as though that were the, the only official image for God we could have, yet, yet Scripture is full of others. God as rock, as cloud, God is mother in other places, but, but we find father being the word that Jesus uses here. It's an echo of the Aramaic word Abba, daddy. It's a very intimate word. It, it's not that, that, that father that has distance. It's, it's emotional. It's connected. It is, of course, also sexist. Got to admit that. But in Jesus' world, in the first century, when Jesus was teaching his followers how to pray, the world was less just than it is today. The mother in a household didn't have much in the way of power. She was the property of her husband. 
And so for Jesus, trying to convey this sense of, of connection, of love, but also of power, Daddy was his go-to word. If Jesus were praying today, he might choose a different image. Crossan suggests that the image that works best is possibly householder, which doesn't have a whole lot of emotion to it. But if you think about the father in the first century, the one who was in charge of the household, who in a way ruled over all the family members, but also the servants, who was responsible for caring for the livestock, who was responsible for taking care of the family business. That role of householder is something that maybe makes sense. The provider, the one who cared for all of those that were under his, yes his, authority. So Crossan posits this image of householder. And then he moves into the rest of the prayer. Hallowed be your name. God's name. Something that, that we, we talk about, but sometimes I'm, I don't think we know what we mean when we say it. We look back at the story of Moses as he encountered God at the burning bush and he asked, what, who shall I tell the people is sending me? And God gives this wonderful answer that, that our Jewish siblings will not pronounce out of respect. They'll say Adonai, which means Lord. But the four letters of God's name, the unpronounceable, basically means I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. And so God, our God, the God who gives us a name that isn't a name, we talk about hallowing that name, about setting it aside, about making it special. But I think maybe when we think of it that way we miss something. A good name, which I think we all hope to have, and it doesn't matter what our parents gave us as a name name, but that good name, that good reputation. If that's the name of God that we're hallowing, God's may God's reputation be exalted because we can see what God is doing in the world. Hallowed be your name. What would hallow God's name? Things working well in the world. If we think of God as householder, if we think of God as the one in charge who provides for all who are under God's holy care, that being everybody, we think about what a well-managed household in the biblical era would look like. The family would have what they need. Each child given a just portion of what was there. The servants well-fed and well-clothed the animals well tended, the land productive. No one in the household going hungry. And maybe those who are most vulnerable in the household having a little more because their needs were greater. God's name is hallowed. When God is allowed to be that householder, who offers care for all creation. That next line, your kingdom come, a prayer for the end of things as we know them, an end for the injustice that we see daily in the world. It's a juxtaposition of God's realm versus the earthly realms, where the rich get more and more where the poor have less and less, where some feast and others starve. When God's kingdom comes, when the householder rules justly, all will have enough. 
And when we pray, may your kingdom come, we're also pledging ourselves to be part of that, to be part of that household where we work for God's justice. We then get to that line that, that isn't in today's reading. I, I don't know if you stumbled because you wanted to, to put in that line about your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and it wasn't there in Luke's gospel. Well, if you happen to look in Matthew's gospel, you can be happier. It's there. But that's that connection, a reiteration of God's will, of God's justice being manifest among us. The prayer then shifts, moving from our prayer about God to our prayer about ourselves as we ask for God's blessing of daily bread. And we're reminded again of that Exodus story of the manna in the wilderness, of that bread that the people collected. That no matter how much they collected or how little, there was enough for that day. And if they kept it over to the next day, it would have spoiled. That bread of each day it's God's gift. We pray for that. Not just for ourselves, but for all people. Recognizing that God's providence continues for us all. Luke then turns to the forgiveness of sins. Forgive us our sins as we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. Luke uses the word sins. And then indebted at the end, that financial word. Matthew, when Jesus is teaching the same prayer as part of the Sermon on the Mount, he sticks with that notion of debts, of the thing that is owed. I don't know if any of you have ever been at a point in your life when you didn't have enough money. Not just because you wanted to buy a house or a car and you took out a loan, but the kind of not having enough money when you perhaps go and pick up the phone and call a parent or an uncle or an aunt. That call that none of us ever wants to have to make. Or maybe even going to a payday lender. Those people who will charge you 10% a week just to cover your bills. That kind of debt was the debt of the first century, a crushing, soul-killing debt, a debt that often led to slavery, where the only way out was to sell your children, your spouse, and yourself into servitude. Matthew and Luke both grabbed that debt's language that we like to call trespasses. We, we like to, to transition it to this notion of sin, which is appropriate, but it's grounded in that notion of owing God. What are the things that we owe God? Love? Loyalty? <coughs> service? Certainly we could talk about our financial debt to God. We, we take an offering every week, but I don't think that's what it's talking about. It's the debt of the Spirit, that owing that is foundational to who we are, but also that forgiveness of other people's debts. Because when we hold on to what people owe us, we tend to go bad. I remember back when I was in high school, I was working as a waiter at a restaurant, and one of my, my friends was a bit short on cash. And she asked if I could help her out, and, and, and I had one of these moments where, as I handed her more money than I felt that I should, I also realized there was a chance that I wasn't gonna get it back. I was right. 
On the one hand, I knew that when I handed it to her. On the other hand, I remember it today. Right? When we have people who are indebted to us, we, we hold it strangely. It changes how we relate to people. Whether it's money or whether it's a wrong that we've received, we have trouble dealing with other people that we perceive owe us something. Jesus then in Luke's gospel goes on to, to ask God, do not bring us to the time, or as we pray, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. It's a pointer to that temptation of Jesus in the wilderness after his baptism. When the evil one enticed him to turn stones into bread, enticed him to kneel down and worship. Yet Jesus knew that following God was the only true path. That the temptation to use his own power for only his own good was indeed the great temptation for him. Crossan suggests that the great temptation for people in Jesus' day was the temptation of revolution to rise up militarily against the Roman Empire ultimately in the year 70 when that happened it didn't go so very well and Jerusalem and the temple were destroyed as the Jewish people met the full might of the Roman legions following their own way didn't work so well for the Jewish people at that point in time but what is the thing that we are tempted to do Granted, every so often, I think we all have a desire to rise up, to resist, to, to maybe take up arms. Probably not literally, though. But I think there's a bigger temptation that we all face, and that's the temptation to do this. Right? That temptation to say, what are you going to do? We can't change anything. That temptation of acquiescence, of just letting things slide along, that temptation that leads away from justice, that temptation that leads towards death. Do not bring us to the time of trial. And then we get to the closing lines. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Now, I'm going to ask somebody to do me a favor. Somebody pull out your pew Bible and turn to Matthew chapter 6. Back when I was in Sunday school, this is what we called sword drills, where you would see who could get there first. They'd raise their hand, and I'm waiting for that hand to go up. Thank you, Beth. Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 through 13, where Jesus prays this prayer. Is there a footnote at the end of verse 13? Yes. And what does it say? The print's tiny, I'm sorry. Does it say something like other ancient authorities? Uh, yeah, that's right. Other ancient authorities add in some form, for the kingdom and the power and the glory are yours forever. Amen. Okay. Because that text isn't there at the end of verse 13. It's in a footnote. And this is one of those strange things that happens in our Bible, where the oldest texts that we have don't include certain things. That ending that we Protestants love to put on the prayer is one of those. It shows up in some variant texts that, that when they were compiling different versions of the Bible, some copyist you know, marked it down. But it doesn't come from Matthew. It doesn't come from Luke. And our Catholic siblings, when they reach the end of the prayer, they stop. We Protestants keep going. We include that extra stuff. Just thought I'd mention that for fun. That, that, that's just a little bonus. But there's some things about this prayer that we should hold on to. 
not just the data points, not just the breakdown line by line of what this prayer means and how it connects us to God, but the notion that the prayer is always communal. It's not my Father who's in heaven, it's always our Father. It's always a prayer for all of us. Give us this day our daily bread. That realization that when I have my daily bread, if you don't have your daily bread, we got a problem. And the problem is probably with me. Because our responsibility to live as part of God's household means living as part of God's household. The prayer focuses on God's justice and our participation in it. The reading then morphs a bit. We move away from this prayer that Jesus teaches into a little bit more on Jesus' teaching on prayer. As he tells this parable of knocking on a neighbor's door at 2 o'clock in the morning. Hey, wake up. I need some bread. I hope none of you have ever knocked on your neighbor's doors at 2 in the morning asking for a slice of Wonder Bread. For that matter, I hope none of you eat Wonder Bread. But, but that's a different conversation. Jesus paints this picture of a person who is in need, who knocks on the door, pounding until the neighbor finally, even though they're in bed with their family, gets up and provides the bread. Ask, and ye shall receive. Search, and ye shall find. Knock, and the door will be opened to you, Jesus teaches. And which of you, if, if your child asked you for a fish, would give them a snake? Which one, if they asked you for bread, would give them a stone? Which one, if they asked you for an egg, would give them a scorpion? Parenthetically, none of you, I hope. <laughs> Unless they, like, were snake collectors and asked for the wrong thing because they were confused. But, but all the same, there's this notion that even we who are evil, even those of us who are far short of God's glory, care for our households. If you then know how to give good gifts, how much more will your Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? And I love how we've just done this notion of bread and egg, how we've done tangible things, yet Jesus comes back and says, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask? When we pray, we ask for God's bread, we ask for forgiveness, we ask for all of these things that Jesus taught. But ultimately, it's the Holy Spirit that God gives. That Holy Spirit is the greatest gift. Three years ago, when this text rolled around in the lectionary, you may remember singing with me. I'm sure you do. We sang the Janis Joplin song, Oh Lord, won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? It's a great congregational hymn, and we're not going to sing it today. Because the gift that God promises isn't the Mercedes Benz. It's not the second house out in the Hamptons. It's the gift of the Spirit. It's of the bread that is enough. It's of the community of Christ drawn together to build God's justice in the world. That's the prayer that Jesus teaches, a prayer that transforms us, and a prayer that draws us together in transforming the world. May we then be blessed as we pray together today and each day that God's reign might come among us. Amen.